Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Signum University's unofficial uh, Hugo Award evening. Uh, as we speak, um, the Worldcon uh, convention is happening in uh, New Zealand or the digital New Zealand, because, of course, this year they've had to move the whole convention online, a little bit like uh, what we're doing with MythMoot. Um, and uh, I think it's it's wonderful that they've managed to put everything online. And from what I hear, it's it's been um, it, it's been going extremely well. Um, the Hugo Award uh, will be uh, announced uh, tomorrow. Um, so this is a kind of pre uh, award evening event, uh, very unofficial, very unaffiliated. If you imagine that the big um, proper ceremony is happening in the convention center down the road, this is very much kind of you know a house party. <laughs> but who knows? Um, perhaps George R. R. Martin will wander in, or or whatever. And and as you can see, we've dressed up for the event because this is um, pretty much the Oscars for uh, fantasy and science fiction, um, mm -hmm. along with the Nebula Award. Um, this is like a kind of a big deal. It's great to be, to be celebrating uh, novels in science fiction and fantasy. And of course, um, the Hugo Award also awards lots of other categories as well: novelettes, podcasts designs so do check out their full list we're just going to be talking about the best novel um, award category tonight and we're going to be talking about each of the novels on the short list um, the hugo award was first uh given out in 1953 so it has some considerable pedigree um, it's chosen by members of the world science fiction convention which can be literally anyone uh, you just have to pay a small fee to to be a member um, and so uh, the members actually choose which novel wins um, so it's very different from other literary prizes such as the booker um, and this year is a historic year because uh, there is a all-female lineup um, for the first time uh, and still if you google um, best science fiction or fantasy authors uh, inevitably you know the, the, there's a big wall of men who come up and um, uh, there, there is a kind of shifting tide to seeing, um, you know, recognizing the great talents um, in, in female science fiction and fantasy writers. That's been a long time coming and they haven't just sort of appeared um, out of the ground. Um, I think, you know, things are starting to change and people are starting to catch up. And it's great to see award ceremonies um, sort of reflecting that change um, and uh, recognizing kind of what, what are the most exciting um, in, and interesting novels that are coming out in the genre. Uh, I say science fiction, um, that is true, but uh, the Hugo Awards doesn't um, limit the definition of science fiction. It's in the Diana Wynne, school, uh, Diana Wynne Jones School of um, Genre, where she said, uh, you know, if a story has a magic carpet or a rocket ship, it doesn't really matter. Um, so science fiction, fantasy uh, are kind of blend together um, when you think about it. And indeed, fantasy novels, what we would, what most people would call fantasy novels, have won has won the uh, the Hugo Awards uh, in the past. Um, as I say, we've all read one of the um, shortlisted titles, and we're all going to be talking about um, the book we've read. We have a wonderful panel tonight of Signum University uh, people, um, a mixture of staff and faculty, and we're all kind of uh, dedicated readers and fans of science fiction and fantasy. Uh, and I can't wait to hear what people thought of their novels. And we'd also love to hear from you, so please do have your questions coming in. Thank you very much, uh, Takako, for the comments about the uh, the hats and uh, uh, how everyone looks. Um, that's that's wonderful. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, there will be a chance to ask specific questions about each of the novels after each person has presented. Um, and after each person has presented on their novel, we will also have a um, period of open discussion when we talk about some of the wider uh, messages in this year's shortlist. So very much looking forward to that. Um, but let's begin with our first novel. So Trevor uh, has read um, uh, The City in the Middle of the Night. Um, so if I ask everyone to, everyone who isn't presenting to turn off their webcams and then Trevor, you remain and take it away when you're ready. Oh, thank you. So, um, City in the Middle of the Night is set on January, which is a tidally locked planet. Uh, one face is always towards the sun and very, very hot, and the other is always dark and um, murderously cold. And everybody lives on a twilight zone between these two um, halves of the planet. 
So humanity has traveled to January in generation ships and has settled in several cities, which over the years have become dystopian in different directions. Uh, ZS Font is a highly regulated police state, whereas Argello is a statically chaotic hellhole anarchy. And the main characters are Sophie, who starts out as an ordinary person in ZS Font, and she finds herself among student revolutionaries. Uh, she admits to a crime she didn't commit because of her love for Bianca, the person who did do it, and she finds herself exiled into the cold, dark side of January. She is rescued by the Gellet, who are enigmatic aliens who offer her an opportunity to help end their conflict with humans on January and ensure the survival of both species. She refuses at first, but they release her and they give her something she can always use to find them. The other character is Mouth, the last survivor of a nomad tribe. She is basically trying to stay alive and maybe reclaim the recordings of her culture that have been um, captured and stored in a fortress in CS Font. So the story really switches between the two of them as they try to survive and thrive in these two cities as smugglers and couriers in the um, cities and also in the dangerous area between them. Um, they find themselves involved in a slapstick invasion of Zia's font from Argello. And then Sophie meets the Gallet again, and she agrees to undergo an extraordinary, inter inf extraordinary transformation that promises to, to change their world. I liked it. I, I enjoyed it. It was a good story, um, well told. It used some of my um, favorite uh, science fiction tropes. I liked the setting. It was uh, some interesting world building, um, setting up this the, the two cities, both dystopian, but in very, very different ways. Um, I really thought um, she did a good job with the aliens. Um, they're definitely other. They're not just humans with bumpy foreheads. And then I like the way that the uh, narratives were intertwined. Um, you have outsiders and exiles who, um, you have Sophie, who's an ordinary person who's thrown into hostile situations. She's a fish out of water. And then um, towards the end, she becomes a savior figure. And then we have Mouth, who's kind of an interesting character. She's a tough survivor. She survived a, a massacre of um, her, um, for people, and she's trying to come to peace with being the last of her people. And there's kind of overall sort of a cyberspace, cyberpunk sensibility, high-tech lowlife, um, as Gibson might put it. But it's tech which is getting used up and broken and not being replaced. So there's a definite trend downwards in people's um, ability to to keep um, to keep surviving and thriving. Um, Things that I didn't like about it, I think by far the most interesting part of the story was Sophie's transformation towards the end. Um, it brings about the possibility of positive change in what is otherwise a very static situation. So that's really the most interesting part of the story, but it doesn't really take place until about 80% of the way into the story, and then it's um, cut short after that. So I guess I would have liked to have seen that um, part start earlier um, and go into more detail in her um, struggle to to take the gift that she's been given with a transformation and you know bring about change in this um, society. So it ends on a hopeful note, um, but I would like to have seen more of that part of the story. And then I would also have liked to have seen a fuller ending for Mouth. Um, she becomes less important to the events and her, her story is just as interesting, um, but it's not really, um, it's not, fully developed as well as it could be. And I really think that um, her nomad, her peoples um, have some wisdom, they have something there that maybe could combine with Sophie's gift to to create something which can really um, create, you know, positive change in, in this world. So um, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a really good book and I wouldn't be surprised to see it, uh, wouldn't be surprised to see it win. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, I don't see any questions yet, so um, let's move on to the second book in our shortlist, um, which is Gideon the Ninth, uh, and Chris will be presenting on that book. All right. It's really interesting. There are some common themes with Trevor's book. Gideon the Ninth was written by Tamsin Muir. She's a millennial. 
from New Zealand, which explains some of the punky, independent in your face vibe. <clears throat> the book is set in a 10,000 year old civilization located on a dying planet, controlled by necromancers who wield <clears throat> energy. Energy is the energy released by dying things, and it's like magic, but with skeletons. Necromancers can speak to the dead or raise skeletons from the grave, use bones as weapons, etc. There are nine aristocratic houses, and if um, Gabriel, you can show the other image. There are nine aristocratic houses that were formed to serve the immortal emperor, and each house has its own characteristics. The second house are soldiers, the sixth house are scholars, and the ninth house is uh, the viewpoint house of this story. They guard the locked tomb. Each, um, each house is invited by the emperor, uh, it's like a once in a, a lifetime thing, to send the heir of the house, who's always a, an accomplished necromancer, with their personal guard, a cavalier, to um, come and see if they can earn a spot as one of the emperor's lictors. The emperor is immortal and the lictors are also very long lived. So each of the houses sends a necromancer and a cavalier to um, Canaan House, which is on like a water planet. And it, Canaan House is this sprawling Gothic mansion that's um, built on top of a, an even more sprawling science facility. And there's hardly anybody in Canaan House, just about three other people, who don't tell the, the pairs from the other houses how they're supposed to go about earning their place as lictor. So they spend their time running around this gothic decaying um, ancient mansion slash science lab, uh, trying to figure out what they're supposed to do there. The viewpoint character is Gideon. She was an orphaned uh, girl who is now a teenager and she was just appointed the cavalier for the uh, necromancer of the ninth house, Harrowhark. Members of the Ninth House are um, all members of a small religious order. They kind of wore Day of the Dead paint uh, on their faces and lived down inside an abandoned launch tube of a small planetoid guarding the locked tomb. Uh, who or what is in the tomb is a mystery. Gideon's background is a mystery. Harrow's is a mystery. The whole thing is one giant, creepy mystery with skeletons serving you dinner and silent monks in hoods lurking around the corner. It's a uh, and strange deadly accidents starting to happen. I, I think the book is a combination of the fall of the House of Usher, the island of Dr. Moreau, Agatha Christie's, and then there were none, a Quentin Tarantino, Guillermo del Toro, Mexican Day of the Dead martial arts film, and a Sex Pistols concert. It's a very uh, punky and wild. The world building is fantastic. It does have a bit of a slow start where they're all just running around Canaan House and, and everybody's trying to figure out what to do. But uh, once the murders start happening, it really gets going. I liked it. It should win. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I'd like to invite um, Sparrow onto the stage now to present uh, the novel she read, The Light Brigade. The Light Brigade by Cameron Hurley checks all the boxes. It begins on Earth in the eh, hundred, maybe closer years in the future, 200. And for this gal who was raised on Heinlein, it begins in a familiar mode. Our protagonist, Gina Dietz, joins up She's a soldier, and boy, do I love a good military novel. And she joins up for good reasons. Her heart is pure. She's, and, and you know where that's going to lead when a young person is going wide-eyed into battle. She's not signed up with a country. She's not signed up with planet Earth forces, she has signed up to be a soldier for one of the mega corporations which control the economies of Earth and the moon and other places in the solar system. What happens when you've been fighting against other megacorps and then there's a merger? What happens when the soldiers travel at light speed 
by being broken down into light wavicles. So that kind of exploration is just what science fiction is for. The character goes through some great development. Cameron Hurley is known a bit, our author, for lots of grit. And that's where we start to separate from that wide-eyed Heinlein start. There's grit. There's sweat. There are a few more bodily fluids than I like to read about, but this is Hurley's signature. Um, it's real. It's hard to become a soldier, and we go with Private Dietz through this experience. So that is fantastic. There's a mystery to solve. But I cannot begin to describe it because spoilers, sweetie. There's, and, and we solve it right along with Dietz. There are memorable characters. There's a very satisfying um, enemy. At, at, at the beginning, we understand that there are aliens who are the enemy. As the story develops, it becomes much more complex than that. And there's satisfying rebellion against the truly oppressive enemy. There's some time in jail. There's some time in the nuthouse. There's the endless boredom of the soldier waiting for the next deployment. There's the frustration with the officers and administrators that you have to deal with for all that this story, and it's a good story. I think that it is not told the best it can be. Reading it could be a slog in places, and then, like the lightspeed soldiers of the Light Brigade, the end jumps right in with very little development. The story is great, and I want to read the revision and the next draft because it's it's so close. I'm glad that I read it, but it wasn't so awe-inspiring that I think I'm going to read it again. That's what I've got. Fantastic. Thank you um, very much, Sparrow. Um, <clears throat> there we go. There I am. So I clicked the wrong button. Um, uh, thank you very much, Sparrow. That was that was really interesting to hear. Um, so I'm going to be I'm presenting on my book next, um, which is A Memory Called Empire um, by Arkady Martin. Um, oh, when I say my book, it's the book I read, not the book I wrote. Um, it's a very interesting novel, and I, I, I use that word interesting um, both in the in the kind of genuine, it is interesting, but also in the slightly kind of academic, it's interesting, therefore problematic way. Um, it's, uh, but, but mostly the, the first sense, um, it, it is genuinely interesting, and, and I, I think there's a lot of good things about it, and I did enjoy reading this. Um, the story is about a, an ambassador called Mahit, who uh, travels to a the heart of an empire, um, sort of a, a glorious capital, planet, and city of uh, a vast empire. Um, and she has um, what's called an imago, a device in her head, which uh, enables her to draw on the memories of her predecessor, the previous ambassador um, to the post, as he was captured 15 years previously. And so he's like a voice in her head uh, for the purposes of kind of institutional memory um, so that she can do her job better um, with all his expertise and everything that he learned about the customs of this uh, dangerous and interesting and difficult place. Um, quite early on, uh, she discovers that her predecessor is dead. And this causes the um, 
Imago device version of our predecessor to freak out and something goes wrong with the Imago device and he goes silent. And so she's alone without him. And for a lot of the novel, she's trying to get back to him or trying to connect with him. Um, she also works out pretty quickly that this is a murder. So in a way, this is a, a murder mystery novel. And certainly that's a big part of it. Um, there's uh, other elements as well. Um, uh, quite a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of world building. There's a lot about the um, setting, uh, the the uh, kind of the alien characters. Um, they all have names like um, One Direction. Or, well, it's not, it's Six Direction actually. Um, 12 azalea um they, they they follow that kind of pattern there's a sense of their language their culture um the uh uh the, there's a kind of there is an othering there's a sense of the other but actually the main character mahit is that other in this culture um uh, some of the my favorite moments were when uh the narrator said that mahit used the uh, word for the Texacani word for um, terror that also means happiness or something like that. There's a kind of sense of the, the way this language works, it works very differently from English. So it's not just kind of they're alien, uh, there's actually been a, quite a lot of thought and um, really cool ideas mixed in um, with, with what kind of alien they are. Um, I uh, listened to this novel on Audible on, as an audiobook. Um, but I also bought the novel as a paperback and I read bits of it after I'd finished the Audible version. And I was kind of surprised actually. Um, I did find the audio version quite confusing at times um, because it is a novel about um, multiple voices and personalities in people's heads. Uh, and sometimes it was very difficult to work out who was saying something aloud, who was thinking it, who, who was a voice in Mahit's head. Um, the paperback does a much better job of that because it uses um, uh, sort of arrows instead of quotation marks um, for when um, Iskinder, who is the name of the, uh, the previous ambassador, says something in Mahit's head. Um, but the other weird thing that I didn't come across in the audiobook, um, but is in the paperback, is that so much of this is in italics uh, for emphasis. So um, all the way throughout, the, there's a, a lot of emphasis on different words and they're put in italics, a little bit like how uh, graphic novels and comic books often bold uh, uh, words. Um, I don't know if that would have been annoying if I'd read the whole book in the paperback form. I didn't notice it at all. It wasn't apparent in the audio version. Um, but I think what it would give is, is a kind of sense of everything being quite intense and stressful, which would kind of match um, the situation that um, Mahit is in. Um, the reason I'm, I, I started off with this summary by saying it's it's an interesting novel and I don't necessarily always mean that in, the, in a good way, is that uh, it's to me it felt like there was too much going on here um so um arcady martin is a really interesting person um she it's uh the, the arcady martin is her pen name um and she uh, said she, she devised this pen name because she wanted to sort of split up her identity a bit so that when people searched for her author her, her writing work uh, they would find Arcady Martin, and when they searched for her academic work or her city planning work, they would find um, her other name. Um, and, and this kind of uh, is very fitting for a novel that is about multiple identities inhabiting one person. Um, and uh, Arcady Martin did a PhD in um, Byzantine global and comparative history. Um, and she said that she um, put a lot of that into this novel. So there's a lot about kind of empires. There's a lot of kind of big ideas. Uh, she wrote it during her postdoc uh, at, I think, Uppsala University. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff in here. There's a lot of kind of different identities in here. That, the question that runs throughout is, who am I? Uh, and I never kind of got an answer to that question, which is maybe the point. Um, I, uh, there was, there's a kind of love story in there, but it, it didn't really, um, I never quite knew who the main character was. So that didn't make as, enough of an impact on me as I wanted it to. Um, I think it's kind of the point of this novel that you don't know who the main character is, that the main character exists in a plurality. 
um, that they're, 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 you know, she'll be talking to someone and she'll be half remembering something that her predecessor, who sort of lives in her brain as a memory, um, did to that character. And then there's a kind of like double exposure going on. Um, but the problem was that there were plot moments towards the end that just didn't have the impact that I wanted them to have. And I didn't feel that Mahit had enough um, agency or I knew enough about who she was by the end of the novel. I, I believe there is going to be a sequel, so it's going to be very interesting to see if Arcady Martin um, picks this up. And actually, this this is this is going to make much more sense when you read um, the next book in the series. Uh, we'll see. Um, but that's all I have to say about Memory Called Empire. Um, but um, yeah, re really interesting to hear about the other novels as well. Um, and and uh, it would be good to discuss some of the bigger ideas um, in the second half of the session. Uh, I'd love to call up Kat uh, now to talk about middle game. Uh, so Kat, if you if you if you can, there you go. There you can come up. Can see me, okay? Yes, we can. Okay. So whenever you're ready. Um, so when Gabriel gave us books to choose from, um, I picked middle game because the blurb said that it's about alchemists. And um, I always enjoy that as a theme and a topic. Um, and some of you might have read some scholarship by John Granger and others who've looked at literary alchemy in relation to Harry Potter. Um, our own Sarah Brown has talked about alchemical themes in Tolkien. So this is sort of an interesting and intriguing way to look at fantasy. Um, so the alchemy in Middle Game is a little different, though. Um, it's very, the alchemists in this are very Frankenstein. Um, it's sort of uh, alchemy and magic as sort of a dark pseudoscience. Um, so we get alchemists creating people out of dead body parts, and those creations go on to create people of their own. And so there's kind of a sense of like moral degeneration with each successive generation of created being. And so the, the alchemy and the alchemists of this world are definitely pretty ambiguous. Um, the main alchemist that we hear about that we don't ever actually meet is um, Asphodel D. Baker, who was apparently the greatest alchemist ever. And we find out over the course of the story that she actually is also a beloved children's fantasy author who writes under the name Deborah A. Baker. So she's kind of playing with the uh, initials there. And um, she wrote a book called uh, the, the Deborah A. Baker children's author within the world of the book, wrote a book called Over the Woodward Wall. And that's about two children named Avery and Hepzibah, or Zib. And it takes place in a fantastical world called the Up and Under. Um, so in these books, she baked um, all of her theories about um, alchemy and her philosophy, um, sort of to indoctrinate the children of the world, um, sort of like C.S. Lewis sneaking past the Watchful Dragons with the Narnia series. Um, so anybody who's read Lev Grossman's Magic Magician series, this might sound familiar of, it, it's sort of the author, Sean and McGuire, kind of commenting on and critiquing the tradition of children's fantasy. Um, and at one point, um, one of the characters says, uh, so the up and under books are secretly al alchemy primers. And someone else says, uh, yes, and the Oz books are similar. Baum was trying to suppress Baker with his own alchemical wonderland. So there's this sort of like um, alternate universe that's sort of being built where we have uh, a timeline that we recognize, but it's not quite the same as ours. And its relationship to our world isn't entirely clear. Um, and it's playing on their having there being real alchemical readings of Baum's Oz books and kind of taking that to mean that maybe he was literally doing alchemical magic in the writing of those books. Um, and then there's other kind of alternate universe references, like references to the American Alchemical Congress of 1901. So it's sort of maybe a little Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell of this is sort of our history, but just nudged slightly um, into something that we aren't familiar with. Um, and throughout the novel, we get these interstitial fragments of Baker's alchemical writing and her children's writing. So you get like a page of over the Woodward Wall, you know, every couple chapters or so. Um, so, but that's not the main plot. That's sort of these interstitial background fragments. Um, the main story is about these two characters, Roger and Dodger, 
who are a boy and a girl, respectively, who are raised separately from each other, but find that they can communicate telepathically. Um, when they're around seven years old, they kind of discover they have this psychic connection and um, eventually figure out that they can actually communicate um, psychically rather than just, you know, having imaginary friends. Um, so just like, um, you know, Roger and Dodger, Avery and Zib, um, throughout the book, we get these, these pairs of boys and girls throughout the story. And I think um, McGuire's playing with these alchemical ideas of the union of opposites. So you get all these dualities um, that are kind of two halves of a whole. So, you know, in alchemy, it's sulfur and mercury. And there's the alchemical wedding of the red king and the white queen, um, the union of male and female, all those sorts of ideas. And with Roger and Dodger, it's really the duality of art and science. So we find out that Dodger is a mathematical genius and Roger is a wordsmith and a lover of language. So they kind of complement and complete each other. And it's it's their kind of journey to be together and be united. That's sort of the main plot of the story. Um, and it, it references throughout um, this Pythagorean doctrine, um, which is where we derive the idea of the music of the spheres. So this combination of um, music being a combination of kind of mathematics and art um, and, you know, the union of the logos and the pathos of reason and emotion, all these different sort of dualities being combined and, and unified. Um, so that's the, the, the desire to embody this doctrine is sort of what's driving all the characters in the story. Um, as with uh, things that are this complicated, um, it slightly loses steam as it goes on. I have to say um, it's very ambitious and it's very complex. It plays with time travel a little bit. So um, in the, the timelines can be a little hard to follow in a kind of delightful and bewildering way in the beginning. And, you know, but towards the end, I'm not entirely sure I followed what was happening. Um, that might be by design. I'm not sure. Um, but it, it left me from feeling wholly satisfied by the ending. But I think it's it's a very ambitious premise and a really intriguing idea. Um, and McGuire's clearly not done. She has more to say. Um, there was just recently announced that there's a sequel coming out in uh, 2022 called Seasonal Fears. And um, actually in October, um, she is due to publish the text of Over the Woodward Wall under the pseudonym of A. Deborah Baker, which is a really interesting um, way to expand the universe and kind of give you the full story that you would only get this fragments in middle game. Um, so I was, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed this reading. Um, it seems that Shauna McGuire is a big Hugo favorite. She's been nominated a bunch of times. She's super prolific. Um, like a lot of people here, I'm probably more familiar with dead authors than contemporary ones. So she's new to me, but, um, she's written dozens and dozens of novels and short stories and poetry and essays and everything. Um, and actually in 2013, she was, um, she set a couple records in one year. She was the first woman to be uh, to appear on the ballot, the Hugo ballot, four times in fiction categories. Um, the first person to appear on the ballot five times in a single year, and the first person to appear on the ballot with a purely self-published work. So she's clearly a Hugo darling. Um, I don't know whether that means she should win or not. Maybe it means it's somebody else's turn, but. Um, it seems like middle game has been really successful in other awards categories. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was successful at the Hugo's too. Thank you so much, Kat. Um, it was really great to hear. Um, I'd like to now invite Brenton to the stage for the last of the books that will be presented, uh, The 10,000 Doors of January. Thanks, Gabriel. Hello, everyone. I want to talk about my book, The 10,000 Doors of January, which I chose simply because of the title. <laughs> but I also have a fascination with doors, which is what exactly precisely this book uh, did for me. Uh, it's exactly what uh, what I wanted from the book. So let me tell you a little bit about it. This is an epistolary book. So this is a book that's written as a letter or a, you know, a diary to somebody else and includes within it, so a book within a book, a book that's written 
as a letter or diary to somebody else. So there's sort of two layers and we get to read both of them together, but each of the people reading and writing only get to read one of them. So they don't get the full story. It's it uh, centers on January, Scholar is her name, and I kind of like the January links we've already seen uh, tonight. Uh, and intriguingly, the the audiobook of this is read by a woman named January, first name January. Uh, January Scholar, uh, she has lots of temerity. Uh, we discover that early. Uh, and she has this kind of energy and ruggedness and kind of a stubbornness that we love to see in little girls uh, that front our fiction, at least for the last hundred years or so. The difference is uh, she's not fully an orphan, as we might expect with this kind of a story. She is being taken care of. She's the ward of a Mr. Locke, a very wealthy man who dabbles in archaeology, basically. Uh, he is kind of like the, the wealthy person that goes and pays Indiana Jones to go out and get stuff for him. And uh, January Scholar grows up in his house, and her father is the person that goes and hunts for these artifacts. Uh, she has to be conform to the world in which she lives, which is about 100 years ago, 120 years ago. She grows up in, in uh, segregated uh, United States, uh, Vermont, so not quite as segregated as some parts, although the book does roam between various uh, parts of the United States. Uh, January, though, doesn't fit into the normal categories. Uh, she's brown skin, but it's, it's like a copper brown or cinnamon brown, and not exactly anything that anyone can imagine. And we're introduced into her world as somebody who never fits in any place at all. Uh, she even doesn't even look exactly like her mother and father from what she understands of them. Her father goes away for these great adventures uh, and comes back a few months later, a little bit older, a little bit wearier, uh, but she does love her father. Uh, Mr. Locke takes her, January, out on various kinds of adventures where, uh, you know, actually they're boring trips where he meets rich people and they chat and everything else. Well, uh, one day when January is seven, she discovers a door and it's a door to another world. Uh, it's actually one that seems to almost appear as if uh, by magic from her own uh, storytelling heart. Uh, and uh, Mr. Locke shows up, sees the door to this other world, and becomes angry with her. Uh, and when she goes back the next day to find the door again, uh, this door to this other world with this other wind that's blowing in her hair, and a magic coin, she thinks, in her hat. It's just a regular coin from that world that she found. Uh, the, the door is no longer there. It's been burnt to ash. And this is something that she carries within her for the next decade. And the story then picks up later when she finds out that her father is dead and presumed missing in one of his adventures. And Mr. Locke has told January that he just shouldn't look for, uh, she shouldn't worry, she shouldn't be watching the road for her father. He's not coming back. And so now we have an orphan. In this case, uh, an older teenager, uh, somebody who has grown uh, in, in stature and beauty and all those things. Uh, and she's also grown in her own ruggedness. Well, I, I don't I don't want to give a ton about the book. I'm afraid of the book uh, tumbling out, uh, of giving you everything that happens. But basically, a couple of key things happen. January's father goes missing. Uh, there is a woman named Jane who has come to January uh, to take care of her, uh, someone who will help raise her up. Uh, and she's a bit mysterious. Uh, she's a black woman from Africa, and uh, J Jane is curious about her but finds her cold and distant. Uh, but together they form a kind of bond and friendship, and, and they're able to help one another. Uh, Jane starts to fall in love with a boy, a grocer's son down the street, completely different class, and it turns out, uh, you know, different class in a lot of different kind of ways that make it complicated but they're falling in love with another one another and uh, he gives her a dog named Simbad or they just call him bad throughout the book uh, so that's Samuel uh, and then uh, so that's one thing that's happens and then we also have uh, uh, an incident that takes place January is brought to a meeting of an archaeologist society, uh, and uh, she is sort of strong-armed into finding her way into the society, but she rejects this, and the result is that she's punished, locked away in an asylum, and she's got to find a way to escape. And in doing so, in this extreme moment, we discover that it is true that January can uh, write doors into existence, doors to other worlds, and she is able to escape from the asylum using her own writing to create the door that's there. Uh, 
And what that begins with her and her dog and her friend Samuel and and uh, her mentor, kind of, you know, Gandalfian black woman, uh, huntress, tigress character Jane, uh, is this romp to go and find her mother and father, uh, who are named Julian and Adelaide. Uh, one turns out to be from one world and one from another world, making January not just different, but entirely unique in all the history of all the worlds. So, of course, I love this book. I'm a, this is Earthsea meets Narnia. It's a great combination of worlds that come together. It's, it's, um, it's got the concept of the wood between the world that we see in The Magician's Nephew in Narnia, where you can come in and out of the different worlds. The, the difference is that the elbow joints of these worlds sit together in hidden places within those worlds. So it could be at the end of a cave or uh, down a river uh, bend uh, and underneath a tree or in an alley or in an old farmhouse. There could be a world door sitting there and most people can just never see it. So you find yourself sailing from a water door into the top of a mountain, or you find yourself tumbling through a castle uh, into a den of lions. That's the nature of the doors between the worlds in the 10,000 doors of January. Uh, so I, I love it. It's great. It's also got that kind of seafaring magical nature of Earth Sea. Although most of the worlds that we're dealing with don't have a structure of magic. Some of them are unusual and some of them the people are, are different. The, the humans, the now, the people with sentience. But for the most part, the worlds are kind of like ours, just tinted uh, and scented and, and colored in different ways. Now, a, a couple things. I, I, I love the idea of door as, I actually think that all books, good books are like C.S. Lewis's Wood Between the World, that they allow children and adult readers to enter into numerous pools, uh, numerous worlds, and, and undergo all kinds of adventures. And so this book is really taking up that theme. It really plays with it. It almost gets a little too metacritical as it thinks about, you know, what doors do in our lives, in our relationships, in our loves, and in our reading. So it, it can kind of, it has a little sense of danger on the edge of that. Um, but I just kind of love the scent of it. I love the freedom of it. I love the characters. I love the the, the names are even playful with. Uh, scholar is not spelt like scholar, but that's actually where the name comes from. January is from Janus, someone who faces both directions. That's one of her key challenges is which path she chooses. Mr. Locke is someone who struggles with doors and, and opening and closing doors. You know, aid is somebody who either does or does not come to someone's aid. These are the kinds of things that we see in the book. Bad, of course, Sinbad the dog plays a key role as dogs should in books like this. Um, are, are there, uh, uh, there are, it's not a perfect book, but it's really a lovely book. It's written well, uh, it's literary, it's fun to read. Um, it probably should be read a little more quickly than I read it. I read it in a month. And so I missed some kind of steps along the way that would invite you into it because there are complexities as it's not just one story being told at once, but a weaving together of different stories. It can tend a little bit to kind of moral questions, but it never goes over the edge. You know, it's it's really kind of pushing back on that whole grave robbing reality of anthropology from our past age. And, and it really kind of tests, uh, you know, what segregation could really mean at a moral level and things like that. But I didn't feel like it went too far. Um, if, if anything, I think it's trapped itself. Uh, it's a, the perfect setup, an elegant setup for more stories. But it, in a sense, with its characters, have kind of closed the doors to future possibilities because there is so much energy and liveliness and light in this book that an adult version of January just couldn't carry it off, just couldn't do the same. So that's my uh, look at the 10,000 Doors of January. I, I'm curious to kind of think about it more as we bump these books together a little bit in the next uh, few minutes. Thank you very much, Brenton. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, the rest of the panel to come back onto the stage as we um, open up to the second half of this event where we uh, invite comments and questions from the audience, uh, especially if you've read any of these novels yourselves, um, whether you had a different or similar experience to all of us or uh, have anything um, to add that you'd like to, to share. Um, Really, really fascinating to hear about the summaries. Um, 
uh, a few things to pick out. One is that a, a lot of these books um, uh, cover so many different genres um, within, uh, you know, individual books, and of course across the broad uh, the board as well. Um, and I began by saying how uh, the Hugo Awards doesn't sort of split um, science fiction and fantasy apart, um, but it sounds like a lot of these novels don't split um, other genres apart either. So, Chris, it sounded like you had. Um, uh, the, the novel you read uh, kind of um, uh, sort of crossed boundaries in a sense, um, Brenton uh, too and 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 Sparrow. Um, I just wondered if anyone sort of had a, a comment on that, um, whether it felt like they all kind of worked together or, or it was natural or whether in any case it was a bit kind of discordant. I think mine's almost purely fantasy. I think it's it's not like we would imagine a, 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 a multiverse story today to be a sci-fi story. It's totally not. And it's not even speculative fiction in the way it kind of speculates in the world. The worlds each have their own rules and beauties, but we only get kind of like glimpses at them. Uh, and it's sort of like the islands and earth sea in that kind of a way that each one is its own culture. Um, or like the, well, we only get about three worlds or four worlds in Narnia, so like that. So it's kind of like that. So I think mine does it well because it's really kind of bought into a certain kind of path. Gabriel, it sounded to me, listening to all of my friends here on screen, that the authors have taken to heart Ursula Le Guin's advice in her keynote speech at the Hugos uh, yeah. several years ago, in which she said, you know, genres were invented by booksellers so they would know what shelf to put the book on. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Tell the story. And it really feels like our, these six women writing amazing books just told the story and expectations and boundaries they didn't have time to be told their place they had a story to tell yeah hmm. yeah that's a really good way of putting it um i i think with mine i'm i'm i've definitely found it a little hard to and to sparrow's point not that we should be trying to do this but if asked um i would find it a little hard to categorize in terms of genre um where middle game falls um i guess it's sort of urban fantasy in the sense that it's very contemporary set in in america we pretty much recognize while playing with some of these fantastic elements but it but those are very subtle it's not clear to what extent that they're even generally known by the population so it, it, it there's a slight secret society kind of aspect um but but something i feel like i could have maybe used a little more of is that genre boundary pushing um, on the cover here, you have um, this really interesting, weird cover of the hand with these candle flames. And um, it's, it's a hand of glory, which is a sort of folklore magic um, item uh, made from the hand of somebody who's been hanged. And um, Harry Potter readers will remember that it gives light only to the bearer. Um, so that's a, a, an item that shows up throughout um, this book that one of the villains sort of makes use of. And I feel like maybe I could have used, a, it's kind of all, in a way the only one of its kind of those old kind of folklore items. And and maybe um, I would have liked to see a few more of those ideas and those old references sort of sprinkled in throughout. Mm -hmm. um, kind of related to that, uh, I, is, is something that uh, you said, Trevor, about the uh, the aliens in in your in the novel you read that they're they're not just other, that there's a kind of um, a mixture of cultures in that novel, and suddenly that's what I felt in um, a memory called Empire as well, that there was a kind of mixture of different things happening in the narrative. Um, so I, I, and I'm curious as well, kind of if other people felt that in in your novels, um, whether there was a, a it, it felt like not just a kind of a merging of genres in some cases, but also a kind of a merging of cultures. For, for me, that's extreme and intentional. 
like this book is meant to add spice and variety to the world like that's like it's entirely how it's it's designed i mean there's some puzzles like why people in different worlds speak english i don't i don't quite understand why that is uh, they don't all but like it anyway the word workers can understand one another anyway maybe that's how it's explained it but like yeah like january scholar is a blend of colors in the midst of segregated America. When she asked if she's colored, Mr. Locke laughs and says, oh no, no, you're odd colored. You're definitely not colored because that has its own kind of character. Um, and so then all things kind of mix together in this world. So there's this kind of blending. And that was kind of my question actually for the panel. Um, and we could set it aside to finish yours for Gabriel's, but like you know, I think of Cameron Hurley's a feminist, you know, geek feminist revolution writer. Uh, you know, we've got intersectionality and feminism and various kinds of people of color, alternative sexualities, alternative systems of power. And I'm just wondering if anyone felt like, like, you know, and we have six women authors in a category of six authors, right? So I'm just wonder for the first time if, if anyone felt like their books ever kind of stepped over into moralism in a way that just didn't help the story or forgot the story or yeah we see this with an environmental writing sometimes right where it becomes about the moral we see especially like you know american christian fiction that's about the you know the the parable or whatever right so I'm, did anybody find that in their books or was all of that kind of fairly carefully handled tamsin muir did a really beautiful job of of talking about people in a way that she didn't make them a representative of their class. So mm. there are people of color, but you only know that because she might describe frizzy hair or dark skin. There, there's never a point where she goes, the African-American necromancer, right? Like it's not, she doesn't put a target on people. There's like obviously- Like or something, right? Like- Right, uh, it, right. Yeah. There's, there's definitely different sexualities, but again, that's not, how people are identified. They just are who they are. They're attracted to who they're attracted or they look the way they look and let's just get on with the story. So I think she does a beautiful job of being multicultural without saying this is a multicultural book. Yeah, sure. I'm gonna speak for Cameron Hurley and say she did beautifully on that. We've got diverse characters all in the military. You know, the great melting pot. Um, color sexualities genders whatever you got and all of that is simply the essence of the individual characters because the big struggle is between classes is between those corporations and the the mini it was it felt like pharaoh and all those people all those beings who are really servants of pharaoh Right. You've got the corporations and then there are those expendable resources which are made of organic matter. That was the fight. And and the focus was spectacular. Uh, I may not have loved everything about the book, but that was handled beautifully. Yeah, that's good because I mean Cameron Hurley's essay "We Have Always Fought" is that what it, it was called? I mean, being really one of the great feminist uh, sci-fi nonfiction pieces. Of, Ever, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to read this book. Yeah, yes. yeah. And so it's nice that she was able then to still let the story be the story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In a, in a beautiful way that made it impossible to think, oh, all of these soldiers are the way Heinlein would have pictured them. There's no way you could have thought that. And it never intruded or got in the way of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's how I felt um, in a memory called Empire as well. I mean, there's a, there's a, um, I think there was, as I said, there, I think there was a kind of a bit too much going on for me, um, but I, but maybe that was the point because that's kind of what the novel is interested in. Um, but I certainly didn't feel that um, there was a, a moralism or, or anything. I, I think there wasn't enough focus or on an individual thing for there to be to fall into that trap. Mm -hmm. um, but there certainly was a case of kind of like i mean there's you know several homosexual relationships for example but it's just like hey this is the story and uh, there's a murder and we need to get to the heart of the um corruption and the empire kind of thing so it's a very kind of 
story focused approach uh, which I appreciated um, but also appreciated the representation um, of um, you know an LGBTQ author writing about LGBTQ characters um, so um, you know that's what I'm all for that as well Um, I, I found that um, given that we had like a, a panel of all, you know, contemporary, you know, young, I think mostly, um, you know, female authors and everything, um, this book for me was less um, overtly kind of moralistic and political than I was expecting, kind of, you know, in line with, with Brenton's question. Um, and that's not, a, you know, necessarily a, a criticism or, or anything. It was just not quite what I was um, expecting to kind of find there. Um, and yeah, like it, it, it's a, it's a fairly um, homogenous group of characters. Um, I think I could be wrong about this um, if I, if I miss something or misremembered, but I think pretty much every character is white. Um, there, there's one character I can think of, like a, a supporting character who's um, American. They're all American, um, but she's, um, I think, like Southeast Asian. Um, and um, it doesn't, the book isn't really concerned with, with romance, really. So it doesn't get into anybody's sex life to any great degree. So, I mean, a lot of times with um, uh, their, uh, I don't know, with, with people's appearance or their, you know relationships or their sex lives like that wasn't sort of the concern of the book so you could i guess um, you could imagine that some of these characters you could kind of project onto them that maybe they're this or that but the book doesn't necessarily explicitly tell you that you would have to sort of supply some of those more diverse readings onto it um so that that i found a little um surprising just given that this is you know a, a very popular recent book and and author and everything um but um so maybe i would have liked to see a little more attention paid to to some of those things um but um yeah it just wasn't uh wasn't quite what i was anticipating in in that respect but again i, I with 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 the romance and everything this is very much a story about a brother sister relationship um, so it's, I don't think um, that's really where she wanted to take the story. So maybe it's sort of fine that she didn't really explore those areas of the character's lives. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah, and I'd love to hear more questions and comments from the audience as well. Um, some people I know have been engaging with this session on Twitter um, just to get us outside of the go to webinar bubble. So um, thanks, Nick, for the, the comment on uh, Six Direction, who, who is a character in A Memory Called Empire, uh, who I um, uh, mistakenly called One Direction. Um, <laughs> there is, totally I found, um, that's a whole other novel. Uh, there is a glossary of persons, places, and objects at the end of the paperback, which wasn't in the audio version. I mean, it's a bit difficult to just flip forward. Um, so it's interesting how different the, the those two versions were, and I certainly would have benefited from um, the the glossary. Would have helped me tell my nine mazes um, apart from the uh, five orchards and so on. Um, although that that is something I definitely struggled with is it's that all the characters sort of blend into one. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Well, I'm happy to take uh, questions from other people on the panel. Um, the the other thing I was just thinking of um, when I was reading my novel was I was thinking back to again Ursula Le Guin and she wrote um, something about uh, conflict in novels. She said that uh, people assume, or it's a lazy assumption, that novel and narrative always has to be about conflict. Uh, and it really doesn't. There's so many other things it can be about. Um, and for me, um, one of the things I really liked about A Memory Called Empire was that it was a novel about relationships. Um, there's conflict in there, uh, conflict um, as a threat at the end, but it, you don't really dwell on that conflict. Um, uh, it's it's more about kind of how do we build relationships. It's uh, how, how do we how do we um, uh, fill in the shoes of someone who's gone. Um, so I was just curious, uh, general comments from the panel about conflict in your novels. Yeah, just just briefly, like about I didn't know how to talk about this exactly, but like I took so long to read the book. Quite frankly, I finished it half hour before the panel began. 
uh, I took so long to read the book because it, like it like it hurt my heart. Like the, the the bad things that happen are just so hurtful. And and maybe I've I've just been um, I read too many old books where they pull punches. I think they protect the reader or they protect the character anyway. There's not really any protection um, in this book. Um, and except for sexual violence, uh, all the things that you can imagine to hurt a little person are there. Um, and they happen to multiple people in multiple ways. It's almost jarring power in masculine wealth. Um, mm. And uh, uh, yeah, and so it like I would read for a bit and then I would just not read anymore. <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, so I, I don't know if they, I don't know if you can, maybe I'm just wimpy, but it, it felt to me like just there was a little too much. I mean, there's an ebb and flow and there's loveliness and I, it's a very pretty book, but um, it, it was hard. I think that part of the, one of the intertwined mysteries in the Light Brigade is who is the enemy? And it's a moving target and unraveling that and seeing it change and trying to keep up with Dietz as she's trying to keep up is, that's part of the fun. That's part of the fun of that book. My book really is Quentin Tarantino. Everybody's fighting everybody. <laughs> You've got these six, um, uh, actually eight swords people and they all wanna test their metal against one another. So while trying to figure out what's going on with Canaan House, they're, they're staging um, duels and then they get a little more serious. Um, and then of course, murder happens, murder. 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 Moi. I mean, like I, I, I watch, I love violent film and I love Quentin Tarantino and I love like monster stories and, and like horror. And yet this story of little girl fantasy stories kind of really set me off. I don't know why. I think it's, I think it, yeah, I, I, I may just need to spend a little time kind of walking this out, but yeah. And I want to hear the soundtrack to your novel, Chris, just because when you bring up Quentin Tarantino, I can't help but think about soundtracks. Well, if you look at the at the book jacket, they're all dressed like these Day of the Dead characters. So imagine mm. like Kill Bill with people dressed like they're going to a Day of the Dead parade. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Yeah, I found oh. the um, pretty much the same thing in um, City. I, it's really all about conflict. It's it's about conflict and maybe maybe some hope for um, humanity to emerge from a, a spiral that's just going to go further down and down so um and the conflict is is actually not even particularly there's nothing particularly interesting to it it's just kind of typical gang warfare so i didn't really it was a little bit of a slog to kind of get through that because it wasn't even it wasn't even it was just kind of newspaper headline kind of stuff um so i think and and maybe that maybe that was intentional maybe when sophie does undergo this transformation and and there's now considerably more hope maybe maybe that's intended to to become a strong contrast to that so um i think that there's sort of maybe two levels of conflict in middle game and um i think the one that sean and mcguire sean and mcguire really kind of develops and and um, I guess gets into a little um, deeper and a little more convincingly is more that interpersonal and, and, and internal conflict between the two main characters. Um, sort of like, like Brenton's book, um, she really delves into childhood trauma. Um, so, um, you know, for, for anybody who's sort of off put by that, you know, slight warning that, that there's some real traumatic things happening to small children <laughs> and adolescents in this book. Um, and um, you kind of are there every step of the way as they are growing up with each other and um, trying to figure out who they are and what they can do and their place in the world and the way that their past has sort of been kept secret from them and why do they have this connection and what does it mean and what does it mean if they lose it? And the, you know, the trauma of having that potentially ripped away from them at times. Um, so again, like Brenton's, maybe she does it a little too well at times. There's times where it can 
maybe it, I could see for some readers that going maybe a little too far. Um, but she really like, um, she does it well and, and it's very well thought through and developed and you understand the thought processes of the characters. Um, I think what's a little less convincing is more the higher level sort of battle between the alchemists. Um, and I think this relates back to what I was saying about maybe the, the moral um, dimensions being slightly underdeveloped. I'm not entirely sure that I understand what separates the good alchemists from the bad alchemists other than kind of generic lines about, well, bad alchemists want power and the good alchemists don't. And it's like, well, but why? <laughs> and what does that mean? And um, and what is it that that separates somebody's quest for enlightenment from somebody else's quest for world domination? And it's left kind of in those kind of vague generic terms. And we're not quite sure. I'm I'm convinced as to why um, uh, some you know maybe Asphodel Baker is sort of. I, I'm, I was kind of waiting for her to be revealed as this, a, the secret villain of the whole thing, and and sort of by the end you're, you're kind of thinking maybe she's she's she really is this beloved children's author, and we don't really ever learn what's different about her, what separates her from some of these um, villains that she sort of created. So um, I, I would have liked the conflict on that plane to be a little more developed, but on mm -hmm. the level of the character interaction, I think it's it's really well done. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's there's conflict and there's conflict. Um, so you know, memory called Empire said isn't really concerned about conflict, but there is m a murder in it, and there are murder attempts as well. Um, but I, I guess it was about the focus on kind of the what if question, um, which I, I think is what science fiction and fantasy is is all about for me. Um, and Sperry, you had that great great phrase, what science fiction is for, uh, in regards to your novel, even though uh, you had some issues with it. Um, I would love to um, get some thoughts from the audience as we, we start to wrap up. So um, I'm going to ask you to vote uh, on two questions. The first is, um, which of these novels do you think should win the Hugo Award Best Novel um, based on what you've heard tonight or based on your own experiences of reading some of them? Um, so what I'm going to do is just read out the uh, the titles, and then if you, 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 there's a raise hand option, which is on the go to webinar panel in the top right. Um, you should be able to raise your hand um, by clicking a button. Um, and uh, if the members of the panel, you can raise your hand by physically actually just raising your hand, and I'll count you as well. So, uh, who thinks that the city in the middle of the night sounds like it should win the Hugo? That was award? your book. Gabriel? No, that was, that was Trevor's, Trevor's book. Trevor. Yeah, so Trevor's, Trevor was entered on the city in the middle of the night. So Trevor thinks uh, it should win. No, nobody in the audience. Um, can we just <laughs> test the um, the hand raise function? If you could just um, raise your hands, just so we we know that everyone can do that. There we go. Okay, and then just, I'm gonna I'm gonna click a button to lower all hands down. So just while we're waiting for the sophistication of that technology to settle in, I do want to mention that my book had a Prince Edward Island connection. So one of the oh, doors wow. was in oh, Prince yeah. Edward Island, which I didn't know. And they actually, she actually paces the book with the releases of the Anne of Green Gables novels. So that's how we kind of know as she's growing. And so I've written to the author to talk to her about that, but she hasn't. It's The, the books are really less like Anne and more like the Emily of New Moon series in the 1920s, mm -hmm. whose character does suffer. But anyway, that was just for free. That <laughs> that, well, that might sway a few people, a few <laughs> Anna of Green Gables fans in the, in the room. Um, <laughs> did you know that there was that connection before you read it? Or was it no, surprise? no, like this was, I, I, I literally picked it for two reasons. One is the title, I like Doors. Um, January, I didn't know if it was a person or a place or a month or whatever. And uh, the cover is just really pretty. Like, Beautiful. Like, wouldn't you want your first book to look like that mm -hmm. like yeah it's really nice if it's outdoors i mean um yeah, let's, uh, let's uh let's move on to gideon the ninth uh, reviewed by chris swank so please raise your hands if you think that should win um i you know i'm gonna i'm gonna say yeah. i was voting for it <laughs> yeah so more uh so there's four so there's about five six seven so there's about seven people um I have a question for the panel too at the yeah. end. Like okay, great. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that at the very end. Um, okay, uh, who thinks that the Light Brigade uh, should win? Um, that was my so, so this was, uh, yeah, presented by Sparrow. So a couple of people actually, really yeah. interesting, because you, you don't think it should win, Sparrow, is that right? I think that it's not ready. I, I think okay. it's not, I want to love this book. But it sounds like the others have really got the pacing and the polish that Light Brigade is missing. However, okay. different readers will bring different needs mm -hmm. to the experience. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I wonder if the people who voted for that book have read that book or um, or what their reasoning was. So do let us know in the comments uh, if you write um, one of the in the question box. It'd be really interesting to hear. Um, who thinks a memory called Empire? by Arcady Martin. So this is the book I presented. Who thinks that should win? So you're, Brenton, you're Sounds pointing really at, at me. I'm, I, 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 if it won, I wouldn't be... I, I, I would... I would... I, 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 I wonder whether my concerns with the novel were more about me and I need to sort of reread the novel or, or think about it, or maybe it's better at read as a paperback than uh, listen to. So if it won, I, w I wouldn't have any problem with that. I think it is a good novel. Um, Sparry, were you saying yes to that one? I was saying if I can have an, more than one vote, my okay. second vote would... So maybe, um... maybe for Memory Called Empire. Um, okay, great. Um, well, how about Middle Game? This was the novel reviewed by Kat. Uh, so Kat does think it should win. Uh, there's a couple of people in the comments and the audience as well. Um, so there we go. Um, and uh, finally, Brenton's book, The 10,000 Doors of January, who thinks that should win? Um, again, a couple of people in the audience and Brenton. So, I, so I, I mean, it, oh no, it's a few, few more. So four, few yeah. Okay, so um, now the question is, which one of these novels will you read? So this is the, the final question. And you oh. can, um, you can vote for as many as you like. So, which one do, are, do you think you're actually going to read? You're gonna you're gonna pick up um, and get, uh, have a go with it, and it might be all of them. I don't know. Oh, we can so, vote um, more than once on this. You can vote more than once if you want to read all of them. Then you can vote for all of them. Um, yeah. But I just wanted to see what what of the lists kind of really grabs you um, and interests you. So, um, how about the city in the middle of the night? Yeah, I want to read that one. Yeah, yeah. So, a few people on the panel. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, about four or five in the audience. I put um, that in my sci-fi, like that was the sci fi -est of the sci-fi, mm -hmm. was that right? Yeah, probably, yeah. I, I, I would probably give that a go as well, actually, to, if I wanted. Um, you can't, For me, I have to be in the mood for that, but um, it sounds like a, a, a good book anyway. Um, Gideon the Ninth, um, reviewed by Chris Swank. Uh, so yeah, lots of people as well. So th three or four people. Um, you sold it, and, Chris. Um, <laughs> oh, and Nick says, I read all six, and I think the Light Brigade was the best, but I expect Gideon the Ninth oh. will win. That's very, very interesting comment, Nick, and thanks for uh, letting us know why you've read all six. Um, uh, and Liam says, I read the Light Brigade, though I liked it, I agreed it lacked polish. It was something, a somewhat derivative of early Heinlein. Mm -hmm. um, Takaka says, I'd like to love to read all. Um, Jean says, I've read three and a half so far. I'm going to read all of them. And Bronwyn says, Gideon the Ninth, the middle game. Um, so um, uh, for, for the, the novels you're going to read, I've forgotten how far I got in the, in the, in the voting. I got so distracted by the wonderful comments. Um, but um, uh, I think I, I, I think, I, think I got to the Light Brigade. So um, yeah, so um, hands up if you want to read the Light Brigade. Oh, really? Okay, a lot. Yeah, I'm sort of like I'm, I, it's the Cameron Hurley thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah not it just sounds, what the said, but... it sounds intriguing, even if it's not fully Robert. polished. It's yeah. Robert, but yeah. I would love to talk about it with you, maybe a myth mood. Yeah, yeah, and I, I kind of like what Angry Robots is doing, and 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 I hope that this gives them some. If it wins, it gives them buying power that they can open up their. They used to have like a couple of weeks where they took open submissions each year. It'd be nice if they did that sort of thing again for sci-fi writers. Mm -hmm. um, how about um, Memory Called Empire? Who who wants to read that one? So. Yeah, you'll have a good time with it. 
but probably go for the paperback rather than the audio audiobook. I'd be interested to know, Nick, which one you read. Um, and I'm, I, I think I'm, I liked the audiobook, but I think I would have had a better experience with the paperback. Um, how about middle game? Mm -hmm. my cat, so a few people there Nobody's as well. Nobody's into it. <laughs> not, not so much. Um, the cover and is the Ten Thousand Dogs of January. I definitely want to read this one. Yeah. And that was presented by Brenton. No, no, not violence to children. Oh no, yeah, well, no, I'm not speaking on that. It's not so much violence to children. It's betrayal. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, so. Not really. And and most of it happens most of it happens to like a seventeen year old or nine to nineteen year old. It's not like the seven year old is one thing, but most of the book is in the 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 older teen. It's a new adult book. Um, and Nick clarifies, I read the paperback of A Memory Called Empire, and he also says, did you know that three of the six books are also shortlisted in the Arthur C. Clarke Award, City in the Middle of the Night, oh. The Light Brigade, and A Memory Called Empire? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, and, I mean, A Memory Called Empire has on the cover, long listed for the Guardians, not the Booger Prize, um, right at the bottom there. So the, the Guardians, not the Booker Prize is like what we're doing for the Hugo Awards. It's a kind of unofficial what they think um, uh, should should happen. Um, and Gene says, I liked Gideon so much more than I expected to after seeing that it had a dramatis personae. I, I rolled my eyes at that. I like um, like a Zelansny book, only more so I expected to win. Um, yeah, I, I can see the Zelazny. Um, yeah. if, if you guys are going to try Gideon, it, it's got a little bit of a slow start as you're trying to get into the world building, but after that, it, it just soars. Yeah. I think a Zelazny, too, has that world's doors. Um, uh, what's the Arthurian series called that he did in the 80s? Whatever that one was. Amber? That, yeah, Amber. It's basically a court in another land, right? Yeah, with which connects back. Yeah, so yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That's well done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and yeah. Takako uh, diplomatically says, with good authors, some disturbing parts may be, be meant to be uncomfortable. Um, mm, that's so true. That, that, that's that's a, a way out. Um, so perhaps don't uh, write off the 10,000 Doors of January for that reason. Um, Brenton, you wanted to come in, come no, in that, and sort of... Yeah, no, it was really the question. question, what's the next book? Like, what do you pick up next if you had to pick up one next? But I think you did a pretty good job of, of it. So, yeah. Yeah, well, it, yeah, maybe a palate cleanser, something different. So, and and there's certainly a lot of variety and difference on this shortlisted panel, uh, 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 list of books rather. Um, so, oh yeah, let's go <laughs> to always talking. a good one. <laughs> always good um, to read in between other books. Within, within reach um, at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bit yeah, of John Garth yeah, as well. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> We're all reading the John Garth book now. Yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to our wonderful panel um, for uh, for attending and giving you uh, us your thoughts on these books. Thank you so much to our wonderful audience as well, especially for all the comments at the end about um, books that you've read and what you would like to read next as well. I hope um, we've uh, uh, helped people choose um, uh, the, what's next on their reading list um, and uh, helped people um, uh, sort out some of their thoughts uh, on the, on this shortlist. I think it's a really interesting shortlist. It's going to be fascinating to see what wins uh, which, when it's announced tomorrow. I, I always think that's part of the the most fun part of award ceremonies is the night before and speculating on what might win. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see uh, whether um, whether whether uh, Gideon the Ninth, um, which is is what kind of most people in the audience here thought should win, will win. Um, we, we shall see. Sometimes it's the surprising one that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe who knows, Brenton? Maybe ten thousand doors. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, keep reading, and uh, we'll see you at the next event. And thank you very much, Liam. Thank you, thank you, Bronwyn and Arena. Good night, Excellent. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Okay, bye bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. See ya.